The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the art market's suddenly very excited about NFTs, or non-fungible tokens. But what are they? Are they a fad, or do they represent the future of the art market? We talked to two people in the world of crypto commodities about the explosion of NFTs on the art market. And for this episode's work of the week, we have our first musical choice. The artist Doug Aitken talks about the minimalist composer Terry Riley's 1968 piece, You're No Good. Before all that, a reminder that you can sign up to the art newspaper's Art Market Eye newsletter for a monthly guide to the art trade. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top right of the page. And while you're there, you can also sign up for a range of other newsletters, including our daily email. Now, NFTs. In an online auction that began this week, Christie's became the first major auction house to offer a standalone NFT or non-fungible token work of art. Bids went over $1 million within one hour. Meanwhile, it was reported that NFT works inspired by the British street artist Banksy have so far netted $900,000 on the OpenSea marketplace, which bills itself as a peer-to-peer marketplace for rare digital items and crypto collectibles. The work being sold at Christie's is called Every Days, the first 5,000 days. It is a vast, pixelated work comprised of 5,000 individual images created each day since the 1st of May 2007. It was made by Beeple, whose real name is Mike Winkleman. He's created concert visuals for artists such as Ariana Grande, Nicki Minaj and Childish Gambino, but his art has also attracted considerable prices. A collection of 20 works sold for $3.5 million in December. One of the art newspaper's London correspondents, Annie Shaw, spoke to people about NFTs, and here are some of his thoughts. The entire sort of art market is going to look at this and be like, wow, like, as physical artists, we can do this cool new thing. As digital artists, we can do this cool new thing. And so I'm just super excited to see the, like, cross-pollination of those two worlds. And and I think it's just going to be this explosion of creativity and this explosion of like new art that is super super exciting to be a part of obviously i think COVID is a big piece of this i think people are sitting at the computers all day and so they're they're sort of locked inside and so they've got less options i mean actually last year like i don't even know if i would have came to this space last year if, if there was no COVID. and i honestly don't think the space would have sort of accelerated this fast they are mostly from the tech spectrum the people who bought some of the like more expensive pieces and that's where i think it kind of like kick-started this market they were sort of people who had had made a lot of money on crypto and to be honest if you made a lot of money on crypto you were buying it back when it was really not that proven and it was kind of pretty speculative and so they made a lot of money on that and now they started sort of speculating on this art stuff on these nfts and so i feel like it sort of like got it off the ground really fast like these people sort of like betting on this before it was this very like proven thing Now, Jason Bailey is the founder of the analytical database ArtGnome and an artist himself. And he spoke to Jason in depth about NFTs and the events of recent weeks. So Jason, we're here to talk about NFT art, which has kind of reached fever pitch over the past couple of weeks. I mean, you can't move on Clubhouse for conversations about NFTs and art. I mean, I've lost whole afternoons to them, but uh, and NFT stories are trending on the art newspaper's website. Um, but before we get into that frenzy, I wondered if you could just explain for our listeners exactly what an NFT is and how an NFT work of art is created. Sure, yeah. So uh, NFT is an acronym that stands for non-fungible token, uh, which is a pretty intimidating um, string of words. And then I think the blockchain itself as a concept can be kind of intimidating for folks too. So I like to give a pretty high level um, description so that it doesn't get into the technical weeds and lose people. Basically, I think at this point, almost everybody's heard of Bitcoin, even if they don't really know what it is. So Bitcoin is a a digital currency and it works on this premise that you can have a provable scarcity 
And even though it doesn't exist physically as a coin, um, which some people you know, actually may not even know, you can use it as money all around the world. Um, and what artists figured out, I guess, uh, 2016, maybe earlier, but you know, the, the big uh, sort of start for this was 2016, is that you can apply those same principles that you apply to a digital currency that you can use around the world to art and prove that art can also be digital art in particular, can be scarce and provably rare and uh, tradable, buyable, sellable, destroyable, um, all online using a similar sort of uh, mechanism or thought process to what people are using for cryptocurrencies. So say I'm an artist, um, how do I go about minting is the term, isn't it? You mint an NFT work of art. So you go to one of these marketplaces, is that right? And then what happens? Yeah, yeah. So the old timers used to call it uh, tokenizing, and now I think they call it uh, uh, minting more often. And there are a handful of platforms. Um, so if you're an artist and you want to get started today, one of the things to know is some of the platforms have curation. And with NFTs becoming wildly popular in the last few weeks, um, the waiting lists can be really long to get onto the, the more curated platforms. But the two that I tend to send folks to that are just really excited and want to get up and running are um, Rarible and uh, OpenSea. So Rarible and OpenSea will take anybody uh, who wants to can, can produce work and mint it on those platforms. Um, there is a little bit um, of a trick for new folks to get up and running, and that's that you... You actually have to have, I think it's the case for both of those platforms, you have to have some cryptocurrency to, to pay for the transactions. So um, let's say you create your digital artwork. Um, normally what people would do is go somewhere like Coinbase, which is a pretty mainstream, easy to use interface that's you know backed and, and fairly secure, and connect it to their bank account and be able to bring some funds in from their bank to Coinbase. Um, so that they have these th this uh, currency on hand to be able to pay for some of the processes that are required to get the work minted. And then there's something called MetaMask um, that, that you're going to want to download. It's a browser extension. And up front, this can feel a little tricky. It's a bit like the early 90s when uh, people were just the, the nerdiest among us were getting onto the Internet. And for normal people, it was like, wait, I have to get a, a modem? What is that? It makes a screechy noise and like this seems too technical so we're kind of at the screechy modem phase of nfts where um you know you have to kind of go through a few steps to get that metamask wallet set up and get some cryptocurrency in there but the good news is the community is really um excited about this and willing to help new folks so it's not hard to find someone that will be there to patiently kind of help you as, as you walk through but if we fa if we fast forward and assume that you've got that currency these these platforms are designed to be really simple so it's just a matter of you upload um, your digital image and then you add a, a name for it and you can decide how many editions of it you would like to have um, to make available you can decide if you want to put a starting price or not and then you pay some gas it's called uh, there's gas fees for for these transactions on the ethereum chain and uh, we can get into it a little bit later but gas fees actually are variable so they can be as low as you know a dollar or less and crazily, when things go nuts and really popular, like, you know, everyone's minting right now because everyone's excited about NFTs, I've seen gas fees as high as $300. So that'll become important later. So a gas fee, could you just clarify that? Because I've been reading about the environmental impact of NFTs in that they're very, it take a lot of energy to produce and distribute. Is that what you're referring to? So um, I'm not technical enough to be able to tell you what, if, the, if it's the gas fee in particular that contributes to the environmental issue, um, but I think we, can, um, we should, can and should touch on the environmental issue. But the gas is essentially, um, in order to get your transaction through, there's a, a line of blocks that um, are, are sort of in queue, and you get kind of put in that line. And if you pay more, you can have your transaction go faster. If you pay less, you know, it can go slower. So it kind of prioritizes around that. Um, and everything you do, well, I should say, because we're being smarter about gas fees, which we don't want to exclude artists by having super high gas fees, a lot of the folks that built this sort of community, the premise was 
let's make something decentralized that everyone can, par can participate with. But you can imagine if I don't have a lot of money and I'm an artist, which is pretty common, most artists don't, spending $300 is out of the question just to get this thing minted with no guarantee that someone is going to, to purchase it, right? So, but the thing to know is that that's not always the case. And if you wait, um, it'll, it can go up and down in terms of the, uh, the, the fees. Jason, something I've been reading quite a lot about is how much energy it takes to produce and distribute NFTs. What can be done, you know, to offset this sort of huge carbon footprint? It's hardly, you know, green, is it? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a real threat to the entire space, right? So for all the work that we've put in, um, Mimo uh, Aikton did a, a report recently that just showed just how bad it is for the environment. Um, and while we have all these altruistic reasons as a group that we're trying to grow this space, um, I, I don't think any of us can deny that there's environmental issues that are involved. Um, and I think the, the way that we tend to look at it is that any technology early on is fairly inefficient and you have to go back to why is it we're doing this and is it worth experiencing some inefficiency up front. So if we can build a better art world that's you know more open to, to collectors and artists all around the world through this decentralization, um, that feels like it's worthwhile to experience, you know, a, a little bit of inefficiency up front. And then I would say um, there's the, the system that actually eats up all the energy is called uh, proof of work, POW, they, they call it sometimes. Um, and it's because the computer has to do a calculation each time you run a block. So what's happening is Ethereum is shifting from proof of work to proof of stake, which is a system that's based on just the people that have the, the largest amount of uh, tokens have to approve the transactions. So that um, introduces new problems where the people that have the most control be, become more controlling because they can now choose uh, what happens, but it dramatically reduces, pretty much almost erases the, the ecological concerns because you no longer have to do uh, run all these machines, right? So that's on the, the um, near-term horizon. No one knows exactly when it's supposed to happen, but my best guess is the next year or two. Um, and then that problem goes away. Additionally, um, a group of us are trying, I'm trying to put together a bounty within the community to figure out what can we do in the short and, and near term before the switch from POW to POS um, so that we can just make sure that our practices are as, uh, as efficient as possible. So I don't think anyone uh, is arguing that it is efficient or that it's not bad for the environment, but I think we're trying to think about that trade-off and figure out what we can do near, medium, and long term. So let's talk about the ups, because as you say, NFTs have been around for a few years now, since sort of 2016, 2017, late 2017, crypto kitties burst onto the scene, I think it was then. Why do you think there's such hype right now? I mean, is it a matter of people being stuck at home behind their keyboards during the pandemic? What's going on? Yeah, so the way I look at it, you know, we buy jewelry and cars, fancy cars and clothing, pretty much all the things that we buy that go beyond just the the bare necessities that we need and we could all wear like plain vanilla uh white t-shirts and have no jewelry and not have makeup and ha drive like the the lowest level car so all the things that we spend money on beyond the basics are basically us trying to express ourselves right like our style and who we are our wealth our you know any number of things and while we're all locked down um that all goes away right so our, our need or our desire to express who we are hasn't gone away, but our ability to do so is gone because we're all stuck inside, right? That we only ever see each other from the shoulders up and on Zoom calls. Um, so uh, I think there was already this this process in place, kind of proving out that you know we could buy and sell and trade digital art, um, and now that the demand to want to have sort of this shared experience um, online has just uh, amplified dramatically. Another way that I would look at it is I'm a bit of an introvert. So in any given year, 15 people maybe, or maybe more than that, I usually say 50. So let's say 50 people cycle through my house and maybe see the art on my walls. But I've got thousands and thousands of um, you know friends via social media who I talk to on different levels every day. So if I buy something and I'm excited about the artwork or the artist and I want to promote them, um, you know, it's a, it's a heck of a lot easier to do that digitally um, than it is physically. And I think everyone's kind of catching on to that now. So it's this way that we can all be excited together um, and share about the art and artists that we love um, much faster than in an analog world. And the other thing we should mention, which is happening this week, um, is the Christie's auction of Beeple's work. Now, Beeple, I should say, is a digital artist who, who recently moved into making NFTs. 
Um, and in fact, as you say, I mean, he used to do sort of a lot of concert visuals, you know, big Justin Bieber, Dead Mouse concert visuals. And of course, those things have all gone away. So he's now reverted to making NFTs and he's done so incredibly successfully selling a series for 3.5 million on Nifty Gateway in December. Um, and he's got this auction, which is launching on the 25th of Feb till the 11th of March at Christie's, which they're billing as the first standalone NFT auction in a major auction house. What's your take on that? I mean, is Christie's sort of getting in on the act? Is it clickbait? You know, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's fascinating to me. So I actually have some background um, with NFTs and Christie's. So in uh, early 2018, they had a blockchain conference in London and uh, a bunch of sort of the early folks that were sort of pioneering this space were invited to kind of go and have a panel. And the, the funny story is, so this artist, Robbie Barrett, who's, you know, a young, really talented AI artist, I had worked with one of the platforms called Super Rare to make up these cards, you know, little like plastic cards that would give you access to an NFT. And we had them put in all the goodie bags for like, I don't know, maybe five or 600 attendees at Christie's. And I, I pleaded on stage, we, we have the video, which is funny. I pleaded on stage, I was like, you are all collectors of, of NFTs now. There's this card in your bag. Please don't throw it away. You know, like this is gonna be like, I'll buy it off of you. Like this is the future of art. And uh, the whole community jokes because like 99% of them were, were tossed out, right? Well, now they sell, if you had one of those cards right now, um, you know, that's probably at base, it's like $70,000 or something like that. Are you kidding? I was, yeah. at, I was at that summit and I don't think I ever got one of those. So I'm, I'm really sore about that. <laughs> yeah, they call them the Lost Robbies because it was Robbie Barrett or whatever. And it's like, they'd be if you have an unscratched, you know, because there were cards and you would scratch them to reveal the thing. So if you have an unscratched Robbie card and you're listening to this, um, there's a pretty massive market. So I, I would estimate that probably a few million dollars worth of cards were, were thrown away based on today's market values. But you know what it was? Um, it's the we were, I think, more excited about the blockchain aspects of it in 2018, and it was just too confusing for folks to, to latch on to. And I think we've learned as a community, you know, NFTs seems to catch on a little bit easier. You know, some people are a little bit afraid of the word crypto. They have the, you know, there's still some negativity around cryptocurrency, and it's mostly misinformation, but people are worried about, like, are these like negative things going on in the background around drugs or this, that, and the other, you know, it's kind of the same fear that happened when computers first came out. Like, are these going to take over our lives? Which I guess they kind of did. Um, or the, when the internet first came out, like, you know, this is going to be for nefarious things and, you know, we'll never talk to our families again. So I think the thing with the blockchain is like, Oh, it's just for drugs or money laundering, which, you know, neither is true. But this time around, I think, we're focusing more on the art and not boring people to get to death, at least up front with all the details of the blockchain. And maybe that was part of the lesson learned. So the, the Beeple sale, I think, is interesting and exciting. So I don't know Beeple personally um, all that well. And I don't think of him as sort of a member of the, the core group of artists that have sort of been pioneering this space. But I have a tremendous amount of respect for him in that he creates work every day. So any artist that produces work every day um, demands my respect. And I think you only get better and better. And I think the work is pretty interesting. I was trying to, as someone who studied art history, I was trying to place it somewhere in art history. And the, the best I could come up with was uh, sort of like a, um, so he swears a lot. So he's like um, a modern Her Hieronymus Bosch who like curses like a sailor is sort of, I think what I tweeted out. It's a good way of putting it. I spoke to him yesterday and he, there were a lot of expletives, um, which <laughs> was, was interesting. But, the, but with his work, I've heard that some people are saying that it could fetch as much as 50 million. I mean, this puts him in the realm of blue chip artists like Richter and Warhol and Basquiat, who've been trading on the secondary market for decades. I mean, this is phenomenal, if true, if it does go for those kind of figures. Yeah, I have I have no doubt um, that it'll go for a lot of money. So uh, at a high level, and this is just the way that, that I look at the art market in the world right now, um, I think I'm a, a big picture guy. I get lost in details. Um, and, but when I look at the big picture, 
I think we have, you know, what people sort of call the boomer generation, right? Um, and then we've got sort of post-boomer. And right now, um, I think maybe not since the 60s have we ever had more of a divide, right? So there's uh, pretty much this post-boomer generation wants to do everything the opposite, if possible, right? And, and partially just to annoy um, the older folks, right? And so there's a ton of young folks who've made a lot of money in cryptocurrency in the last, I mean, in particular in the last year, right? I think Ethereum went up something like 300% in the last year. So one of the things you need to have a, a, a record-breaking sale or high sales is uh, an audience with a bunch of money and interest. And I think this sort of, you know, being the, the younger generation's ability to put a stake in the ground and say, look, you ignored digital money, you ignored digital art, you know, we're the new kids on the block, we've got the, the money to spend, you know, we want to celebrate these artists in sort of a, a new and an inclusive and digital way. Um, so yeah, I'd be very surprised if it didn't sell for a lot of money because there's a, you know, between NFT fever that's going on and there's a heck of a lot of under 30 millionaires out there uh, from, from cryptocurrency. Um, so I think it'll do well. And we're seeing you know, the, the prices are, are pretty crazy just daily on the regular market. You know, CryptoPunks, I think, um, have been selling, you know, low millions. So, you know, million dollar punk the other day. The floor on a CryptoPunk is now uh, 30,000, I think. And these are things that we used to trade amongst ourselves for like 100 bucks or less, you know, just a year ago. That's incredible. And of course, Christie's has said it will accept Ether as a form of payment for the Beeple work, though premium must be paid in dollars. I mean, do you think, as you say, with this influx of buyers who've made their money in tech or in crypto, other auction houses will begin to follow suit? Because as you say, it's a whole new revenue stream, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's funny, I was in Clubhouse during one of the, the presentations with people, and I think it might be Noah um, from Christie's who's sort of managing this. And there was a lot of pressure from the, the crowd because it, it did look a little bit like window dressing. You know, the crowd was like, okay, well, is there a 10% commission? Because that's like core to our belief as a community. Part of why we use this is there's a smart contract that can guarantee if you buy and sell on the same uh, mainstream platform that that 10% that will go on forever. So I've been the recipient of that 10%. I've seen it come out from future sales. It, you know, it needs, we need more interoperability, but it works beautifully. And they were like, uh, we don't know. And then it was like, okay, well, you're at least going to accept crypto, right? Because that's how all these people are going to buy. And they were like, uh, we don't know. So it sounds like they've maybe corrected for that. But I think you'd be absolutely crazy if you were, you know, Christie's or Sotheby's or, you know, Phillips or someone that wanted to kind of pull ahead, not to, to I, I mean, honestly, I would go and acquire one of these platforms now. I would have done it, you know, last year uh, because this younger audience believes wholeheartedly in, in digital property, right? And think about even from a business perspective, there's no overhead. All the shipping and framing and inspecting and evaluating and all of that stuff goes out the window and you just broker sales, which I would think would be a dream for an auction house like Christie's, you know. Um, but yeah, I guess that's where I stand on that. That's interesting because, as you say, I think the, the initial press release from Christie's didn't mention taking cryptocurrency and I think they pivoted after some, you know, a little while afterwards. So interesting that that was sort of done via Clubhouse. Um, if we could just talk a bit more in terms of the market more broadly, um, and we've talked a bit about smart contracts, which I'd like to go into a bit, a bit more, but there's a lot of talk about how, how NFTs represent a different kind of market, which is one which is geared towards the creators, bypasses the traditional middlemen of auction houses and dealers and is more transparent, things like that. I mean, do you think that's still the case, uh, that the aim is to support creators and artists, or do you think tech investors are just using it speculatively? Yeah, it's it's not the the danger with um, this is that it's not monolithic. So I think there's a tendency for new folks to the space, in particular journalists, um, to treat it as if it's one thing. But I think the the internet analogy is a, is a healthy one because you can find a, a full range of uses, um, you know, uh, on how it's being used. So there's a pretty strong cohort of people, especially the ones that have been in this for several years, that are working really hard to build a new art world, right? So the premise was if we use decentralized technology, we can reduce the, the barriers to entry and anyone from anywhere um, could go on today to Rarible and Mint. Now that becomes problematic when the gas fees go way up, right? But um, there's a pretty strong cohort of us that 
are pretty, you know, zealous and determined to try to actually build an entirely new art world that that serves people, uh, a larger number of artists and collectors. Now, whenever anything gets popular, you're going to have people come swooping in, especially if there's money involved, right? Um, and I think we are seeing um, some of the things from the old traditional art world start to manifest. So something like a star system, where a smaller number of artists are making, you know, a larger um, amount of money, and you know, there's a little bit of, of a spike there. But we're sort of intentionally trying to counteract some of that um, by doing things like figuring out how to lower the gas fees. And the other thing I would say is, you know, if uh, if Bob buys a five dollar um, artwork from Mary or whatever, which happens thousands of times every day um, in the, the crypto art space, it no one's going to write about that. It doesn't make the news. Right. So there's this sort of bias towards the big stories. Um, and I think we are seeing a handful of artists sort of making, you know, these really big sales. And it is sort of pulling the oxygen out of the room in terms of what the goals and objectives um, of the community were, and, and I would argue still are. We'll be back with Jason after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Christie's presents Framing the Figure, a special exhibition of diverse works exploring the long tradition of figuration in art. From the piercing narratives of Diane Arbus to the private atmospheric world of Salman Tour, these works demonstrate the range of approaches to depicting the human form in art, as well as the times in which these artists live. Open now until mid-March. Visit christies.com to view the exhibition or make an appointment to see the works in person at Christie's Galleries in the heart of Rockefeller Centre. Welcome back. Now, back to Annie Shaw talking to Jason Bailey about NFTs. We've sort of had a bit of conversation about this. I've seen your tweets on the matter of diversity in in the NFT world. Um, And again, it might be a matter of optics, but it seems, and there have been talks, you know, I've heard it discussed on Clubhouse, how it's a very white male dominated space. And I don't just mean the artists, but the collectors, the gatekeepers. I mean, is this your experience? And if so, are there any steps being made to be more inclusive of women and people of colour? Yeah, I think it hasn't been my experience. I'm sort of a data guy, and I would love to be able to pull out um, stats on this. But there's a, a lot of anonymity as, as part of this, where people don't can choose to, to you know just have a code name or an avatar, right? So it's fairly difficult to look at it um, statistically. But I can share my personal experience. So you know, when I first came in, one of the groups that that really brought me in was this um, platform called Data NYC. And they bring together artists from all around the world who can draw together and extend each other's drawings. And it really uh, expanded my my world and my friendships around the world really quickly in a way that nothing else has. Right. So it accelerated um, my friendships with, you know, I now get men, women, gay, straight, black, white, you know, Asian, whatever it is. I've just expanded in all ways through this community and through this platform. Right. Now, does that mean that when we go to the upper echelon and look at like who's going to sell for the most money um, that we have broad representation? I don't I don't think so. I know because you were in a Twitter thread, you might have seen there's the Women of Crypto Art group that has something like 350 participants. There's some artists of color groups that that have pretty significant participation. And I think the difference here is that. It shouldn't be, again, gas fees are problematic today, but it shouldn't be systematic if there's a problem. We're trying to build it so that there's no reason, if someone says, hey, there's not enough of X in there, X can just come in and participate versus the traditional um, art world, which I tend to describe as being like a ladder with one rung at the top and there's no way to get up the ladder, right? And this is like anyone can publish, anyone can produce, anyone can, and once we get the gas fees back down, that, that will be true again. So. I've got an incredibly broad and wide spectrum of artists that that I support and consider friends um, in this space. And I think systematically by working from a decentralized platform on the way up, it's clear that our intent is to lower those barriers. Um, But where people are in their acceptance of other people is all over the map. And you might have seen that in the Twitter thread too, right? So some people don't even want to have this conversation and they're saying, look, it's decentralized. That's enough. It's like talking about race divides this. And then... You've got people like me, I tend to lean much, much more to the left. And I'm like, hey, if we don't go out of our way to try to make sure that everybody you know, has a, a fair chance to play, 
then we're just going to end up with the same system that, that was in place before. But real quickly, I think that's also something that we need help from. If Christie's or Sotheby's and these other, you know, traditional institutions are going to participate as much as people is worthy. And, you know, we know he's going to break the record for anything that's been sold for crypto. And obviously he's a, a white male, right? So we need to all um, do a better job, old art world, new art world, as we try to build these things out. Um, being uh, smart about, you know, broad representation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I have to say from the, the talks that I've listened to on Clubhouse, they're very inclusive. It's a community which is very open, lots of sharing tips, lots of learning going on. Um, and that's very different to the traditional art world, which, as we know, is very closed and sniffy and, and exclusive. Um, so there is hope there. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about the secondary market for NFTs, which is beginning to emerge, which was perhaps unthought of in the beginning. I mean, are you finding that NFTs are now being rapidly flipped? I mean, after all, you can buy and sell within a matter of seconds, can't you? Yeah, I have to say, when I first started buying um, in late 2017, early 2018, there was no thought in my mind that there would ever be a secondary market, right? The appeal was that these things at the time were, you know, for $10, $15, $20, you could buy 10 things a week, you know, um, and still be spending less than $100. And you would pretty immediately also meet the artists and everyone was so excited about this new thing and like you were rapidly building friendships and it was almost more like a tip than anything and people hadn't ascribed value to owning a digital image anyway yet. So, you know, we never thought there would be a, a secondary market. And then when the crypto bear run came and, you know, kind of crashed, the market tanked and late 2018, 2019, the whole space was sort of holding on for dear life. And we were like, are we even going to be able to get collectors, right? Like, you know, first it was, can we get artists? Then we got artists and we're like, oh crap, no one's buying this stuff, right? Um, and then um, a handful of, of wealthier collectors came in, which drew in even more, you know, I would say sort of average collectors, but there was still no secondary market. It was like, we're, we're still buying just because we love the art and we want to support the artists, but there was no thought that, you know, there would be another market. And then it was really the beginning of 2020, um, a handful of sales, including one. So I had the very first token from Super Rare, which is one of the better known platforms. So I was their first collector um, and I had orchestrated to have, again, Robbie sell some work there. And uh, someone offered to buy it from me first for 3000 then for 5000 then for eight. And I was like, well, I don't really want to sell it. And I never did really want to sell it. And then they came in at 10 and I, you know, I thought about it and I was like, if we're going to prove out a secondary market, someone has to sell something at, at some price, right? So I sold that and a couple of other works. I sold that for 10000 in the beginning of 2020. It sold for 140, I think, at the end of 2020. Um, wow. So I don't know if I should put numbers out there, but I think I sold like $60,000 worth of digital art last year. That's probably worth, you know, a couple million dollars. Um, yeah, I mean, the prices are like kind of skyrocketing, right? People are, are aggressively going through. And I've got the majority of my collection in place, and there are people actively pinging me daily, um, you know, not these particular celebrities, but you, you can see Mark Cuban, Gary Vaynerchuk, Chamath, a bunch of these people are actively building collections now, right? Um, which is inspiring other people to want to collect. Uh, there's funds being built where, you know, the they need to find good work to fill those funds, right? So there is a crazy market. I mean, I was, you know, I was approached by a few different people about doing a fund. And the idea, I guess, would be that I'd put my collection in and, you know, people would get you, you would uh, put a value on it and the investors would provide me some money to buy more work, but they would get a discount on the collection. And I'm like, well, now I neither need the money because I can just sell my work pretty easily. There's a line of people that want it, right? Um, nor do um, nor do I have a liquidity issue because there's like a bunch of people that want to buy it. So like I'm not really sure why I would why I would open up the collection to anybody else, you know? Who was this out of interest, Jason? Were they were traditional art world people wanting to set up a fund? Or... There's been a, a, a blend uh, and actually not any uh, traditional art world people. So there were people from finance and then people from the, the blockchain world, um, you know, that, that are interested. So I've got a little bit of a reputation um, as being someone that understands the art side and maybe a little bit of the blockchain side. So That's unusual. That is the marrying of the two is the thing, I think, because at the moment it's still 
feels like there are two distinct worlds which are slowly, you know, coming together. But you were saying, I mean, the market is going crazy. Is there, are you finding works are being flipped very rapidly because the technology allows for that, doesn't it? You can buy and sell within a matter of seconds. Yeah, yeah, you can. And because I'm generationally sort of in the middle um, and kind of in between blockchain and art worlds, I'm a little conflicted on it. When we were kind of building out this whole space, I thought, well, this is great, actually. You know, the high number of transactions and, you know, uh, a much more liquid market. If you assume there's a 10% royalty, now we're getting much faster towards where artists can actually live, make a living off of their work, right? And I thought, like, that'll be great. And I know there's the whole, like, flipping has a negative connotation in a traditional art world. But I thought, well, we're trying to do everything the opposite anyway. So this isn't going to be a, isn't going to be a problem. But what I missed, which is weird because, I mean, I went to school for art. I consider myself sort of a, a lapsed artist, I guess, um, is that I forgot about the emotional component. Um, as much as artists like money, it hurts a little bit every time one of your supposed collectors sells your work. And if it happens in seconds, then you feel like, you know, it's just a, like pure speculation, right? So... As much as it's great uh, if you're an artist who never sold anything to, to have a new source of income, I think there's some some hurt feelings and some adjustment that are, that are happening as we try to discover what you know what this means. Absolutely, and to speak about smart contracts, which you mentioned earlier. I mean, this is really quite revolutionary. All the artists I've spoken to, including Beeple, say this is huge in terms of disrupting the traditional art market power balance. And just to, to remind listeners that these smart contracts automatically have built in clauses or, or uh, the ability to pay artists a certain percentage of all future resales in perpetuity. And that's between, I've seen between 10 and 20 percent. Um, I've also seen scenarios where you can um, do the same. You can give a percentage back to the first investor or collector in your work to incentivize collectors early on in an artist's career. I mean, this is quite revolutionary, right? Yeah, it's totally revolutionary. And um, it's it's still early, right? A lot of what's happening, I think, is that people are passing around similar contracts or building off of similar contracts. But you could do things like the first collector um, gets a percentage of it when it resales, or you know, uh, an interesting concept that um, some folks from further field are exploring. Or we know it's kind of like um, sports, where like. Uh, only like one out of every 500 artists like actually makes it right and ends up selling for a bunch of money. Well, what if those 500 artists, you know, joined a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is driven by smart contracts that says we all, you know, agree to put in some money together like a collective retirement. But if any one of us takes off, the, the money gets distributed more evenly. So it's like a bottoms up way to, to try to find a more equitable way to support artists and, and move away from that natural tendency we have to make sort of a superstar system. Um, so there's there's a heck of a lot that can be done with smart contracts. I won't be surprised if we become the same way most people can kind of make a website um, today. You know, we're not all great with HTML, but a heck of a lot, it's not like you don't have to be some crazy computer scientist to make a website. I think we'll get to a spot where artists can write their own contracts that could say anything like, you know, you can never sell this again, right? Could be one of the things like, you know, you can buy this work from me, but the smart contract says it's unsellable. Or it could say you can buy it from me, but you have to sell it in the next 24 hours. Like, you know, there's it's sort of like a playground um, in terms of what could be done. And it's just that we're at this early stage where we've kind of tried to lock baby steps. And we're like, all right, let's let's try to get something in here, like around 10%. And interoperability is in, an issue right now. So if I buy something on Super Rare, um, and then sell it on OpenSea. I'm pretty sure uh, they're working on this, but I'm pretty sure as of today, um, the artist wouldn't get the royalty automatically um, if it goes from one platform to the other. But that's something that folks are, are actively working on. Again, it's it's screechy modem days. And as you say, also, I mean, like those that's going to have to be the same if you're going from, say, OpenSea to Christie's or, you know, that it's going to have to expand out into the traditional art world too, isn't it? Yeah, and it'll take the continuous pressure of this generation, um, like like I saw on Clubhouse, um, to make sure that all these things happen, right? So um, I think, you know, there are a lot of people, it's, it's a much larger collecting base, I think, now. Um, you know, a lot of people that were never collectors before, many of these people that just um, were almost like day traders, you know, cryptocurrency uh, folks, 
I've seen a transformation where a lot of them came in and I thought, oh, these people are just going to speculate and they're just flipping and they're buying. And they often were in the beginning. But some of them transform into genuine art collectors and defend the artists and get really like, you know, actually have pretty good eyes for art who then go and get other people uh, interested as well. So it's almost like cryptocurrency is a gateway drug to um, art collecting now, which is awesome, right? Because it's great to see that sort of the new young money um, are transitioning from like, oh, this is just one more token that I can buy and sell to like, oh, wow, I really love the work by this person for like X reason. And like, I've got my friends interested now. And um, that sort of contagiousness can only benefit artists, I think. So Jason, I wanted to ask you lastly about your predictions for the future of NFTs, um, which might be a bit unfair given we're in this sort of nascent stage. But are we going to see big name artists like Jeff Koons jump in, do you think? Yeah, I think that the novelty of the platform will will wear off and we'll see that it'll just be another way to transact that feels natural as, as people become increasingly comfortable with digital property. I mean, you think about music, right? It, it happens so slow that we don't actually freak out much that our music doesn't exist anywhere physically anymore. We all just stream it, right? And do the most famous musicians stream music? Well, of course they do. Like, that's the way we consume it, right? So I think you would expect the same thing to happen in art too where of course the superstar artists are going to go to where the audience is especially if it's a frictionless environment um so I expect that to happen in an extension of that. So even though I'm kind of cruel sometimes to the art world for some of the, the older practices, I have a lot of great friends in the space. And I try to remind folks that like the people in the art trade love art. That's why they're in the art trade, right? I mean, sure, there's a lot of money and shenanigans that go on that maybe are uh, ancillary to the, the passion for art. But, you know, initially they're there for, for the love of art. So they're not bad people. But when my art trade friends say, OK, I went to Super Error, I went here. And like the art's just not any good, you know, and that's why like I'm not into NFTs because the art's not any good. And it's like, well, then you're missing the whole point, right? Like, you know, who's your favorite artist? Okay, now imagine it's them, right? You know, like there's, it's not that um, you have to buy the art by these artists. This is just a, a platform or a, a, a paradigm that allows us to buy, sell and trade digital art much easier than we could before and reduce some of the barriers to entry. And then I think they start to get it. And, you know, the analogy, I think, for, for the article that we put out was that if you looked at three websites in 1995 and all three were about gardening and gardening's not your thing, and then you were like, the Internet's stupid. That'll never take off. It's just gardening, right? Like, you know, obviously anything could happen here. Like any artist could participate. The, the other thing that sort of seems to be evolving quite quickly at the moment is is the display of these works. How do you think that will develop as we go forward? Are we going to see sort of more, more physical manifestations of these digital works? I thought for a long time that people wouldn't necessarily need a physical manifestation. But in the way that I've written about it or look at it is that, you know, I spend less than a minute looking at any given wall in my house in a given day. And I spend something like 14 hours staring at screens. I mean, I think there's statistics that show that that's like below average for Americans, right? So between our phone our computer and our TV, we've got these things that are like primed um, already as screens and have our attention. Like my eyes are already on these screens. I want my art where my eyes are, right? But I think because human nature is to try to bridge from one thing to the next and not take the leap, people are trying to figure out, they want to buy dedicated screens that they can put on their wall that will show their art because that makes them think of like a canvas with a frame. So there's this sort of awkward teenage years thing going on between analog and digital. It happens all the time. Um, if you look at like the Kindle or something like that, right? We went from physical books to a dedicated reader to now, we, you know, we almost don't even read. We just listen to audio uh, for the most part, or, you know, you can read on your computer or your phone. But I think there's plenty of examples like that, right, when we switch from analog over to digital. So there may be some some business in the, in the middle times where people will buy and sell. I mean, there are companies out there that can buy and sell dedicated f digital frames to look at your work for. But I suspect that's going to be temporary because we're already tied to screens all day anyway. So I lastly wanted to ask you about your predictions for the market. Do you think it's going to go the same way as Bitcoin? I mean, that's been famously volatile, you know, if, if in the last few days alone. Um, but overall, prices have risen significantly. Do you think that will be the same for NFTs? So the thing to know about Bitcoin is that people want to debate whether or not it's a bubble or not a bubble. And I think that misses what's actually happening. I call it a bubble gun, you know, those toys that shoot out a bunch of bubbles. 
that's kind of how I see Bitcoin. Um, it's going to be volatile for at least the next decade, I think, where it'll spike and then it'll go down and it'll spike and it'll go down. And I think what we saw in 2018, the art world came in and was like blockchain, 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 and then it went down and they were like, okay, you know, AI or something else, right? And it's not common in the art world to go back and visit something from two or three years earlier. So I think they've actually been a little slow to come back to this because it's like, well, didn't we do that? Didn't we do blockchain two years ago? Like, you know, we need a new theme. But I think this will continue. So we'll see what's called uh, like a winter, right? Which is like the when it's a down period. My guess is, is I mean, if I really knew I'd be a, a billionaire, right? But my guess is by sometime by the end of the year, we'll see things cool off with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And while some people would disagree with me, I tend to think that that also puts a chill on the, the NFT market because those are the buyers, right? That's largely the people that are that are buying. The good news is some of the most creative projects in, in this space happen during down periods. So when there's this hot frenzy to buy NFTs or like there was in late 2017, early 2018, you have a bunch of people running as fast as they can to try to, to mint or tokenize everything. And it's just like, you know, not a lot of substance, not a lot of cool, new, interesting, um, substantial like projects get introduced. It's like a cash grab, right? And then when things get quieter during, you know, like a crypto winter, people are a little bit uh, more creative and thoughtful and there's less pressure to try to just mint everything on the planet, right? So yeah, I suspect that we'll see ups and downs. But if you want to make a bet on digital property, which I want to, and Mark Cuban wants to, and Elon Musk wants to, right? Like a lot of people that are sharper than I am, you know, if you're making a bet on digital property, um, the same way you would make a bet on the internet during the screechy modem days, then I think maybe it's not Bitcoin, maybe it's not Ethereum based blockchains that we'll be using for these NFTs 10 years from now. But this is the time period to, to get in, you know, I guess from an investment standpoint, which is like less interesting to me and more like culturally, like, you know, it's just fun to be part of the early startings of something like this. Yeah, it's a brave new world. Well, Jason, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Yeah, it was really my pleasure anytime. You can read more about NFTs at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iPhone and iPad, which you can get from the App Store. And Annie Shaw is part of the first Art Market Eye Live event with our other market specialists, Georgina Adam and Anna Brady. They're discussing Can You Game the Art Market? And that's today, Friday the 26th of February at 5pm in Central Europe, 4pm UK and in the US, 11am Eastern and 8am Pacific. A bit later, Doug Aitkin talks about the composer Terry Riley. But first, here are some of the top stories on the art newspaper's website this week. A painting of Montmartre in Paris by Vincent van Gogh is appearing on the art market for the first time next month after belonging to the same French family for over a century, writes Anna Sampson. The work's being sold on the 25th of March at Sotheby's Impressionist and Modern Art Sale in Paris in conjunction with the Parisian auction house Mirabeau Mercier. Estimated at 5 million to 8 million euros, the painting has never previously been exhibited. Ahead of the sale, it will be shown at auction houses in Amsterdam, Hong Kong and Paris. A small inscription scribbled in pencil in the top left-hand corner of Edvard Munch's The Scream, long considered an act of vandalism, was made by the artist himself, it emerged this week. As Gareth Harris writes, according to a Norwegian scholar who's reassessed the celebrated painting, the graffitied phrase, which reads, can only have been painted by a madman in Norwegian, was added by Munch two years after the painting was completed. The research was conducted as part of conservation work on the painting prior to it going on show in the National Museum of Norway's new building due to open in Oslo next year. Leaders of museums in the UK have vented their frustration at the UK government's decision not to reopen museums across England until the 17th of May at the earliest. Influential figures, including Rebecca Salter, the president of the Royal Academy, have questioned why other public buildings such as libraries and non-essential retail, including commercial galleries, can open five weeks earlier on the 12th of April. The four-step plan for lifting COVID-19 restrictions announced by Prime Minister Boris Johnson groups museums with other indoor entertainment such as cinemas and children's play areas. Salter told this podcast last year that the Royal Academy was losing £1 million a month during the pandemic. You can read these stories and more on the website or the app. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. This week, the artist Doug Aitkin talks to our editor in the Americas, Helen Stoilus, about how Terry Riley's musical work, You're No Good, led to a collaboration with the composer. 
can you talk us a bit about your kind of early exposure to Terry and, and how he kind of influenced your work? Yeah, I'd really like to talk about the idea of the crossover between mediums. There's kind of a constant flow between you know different mediums, whether it's uh, music or film or uh, you know just different aspects of the arts. And um, I think with uh, with music, sometimes I find structure in music, and that structure translates into the uh, visual art that I'm creating. And it's very interesting to me because sometimes there's ideas that I'm working with. Um, for example, ideas of repetition. And I'm looking at that, and I don't really see that used in a way that I'm interested in using it personally in existing visual art. But then I mm. look to the left of me or the right of me, and I hear it somehow. And I hear someone using these ideas um, in a completely different medium. And uh, I think that that, that was really um, one of the things that, that led me to... Uh, to Terry Riley's music. Um, you know, it was, it was quite a while ago, and uh, I heard a piece, it was called uh, Poppy No Good, You're No Good, and it's um, it's this absolutely violent kind of tape loop. It's very, uh, it's from the mid-60s, and, um, and I remember hearing it and just hearing the repetition of it and variation, the way it would cycle and cycle and cycle, but every time it would repeat, it was drastically different, and it had such a sonic power to it, and I thought to myself, you know, this is a parallel universe. This person, whoever he is, is kind of exploring an idea that I'm simultaneously exploring through moving image and installation. And you know, how fascinating. So every once in a while, you have these moments like that where you see someone else out there in the universe who's kind of on a parallel journey with you. And, you know, sometimes for me, I, I reach out. And in this situation, I... Uh, I simply wrote him a letter. I said, you know, I'd love to just talk to you about ideas. You know, when are you going to be around somewhere? And he was going to play a show, I think, in San Francisco. So I, I flew up there and uh, we went out for coffee and just had this um, really interesting conversation that was, you know, over a decade ago. And that kind of grew over time into um, a friendship and collaborations. Was the first time you worked with him for the Altered Earth project in Arles, or was it before that? Yeah, Altered Earth was the first time we, we formally did something together, a kind of collaboration, performance, and installation. It was so interesting because I, um, you know, I've, I've always been fascinated by happenings, um, by creating these kind of moments that are unrepeatable or unchoreographed. And, uh, you know, I was aware that, you know, Terry was very much part of the Fluxus movement in the 60s and, you know, was both a prime collaborator in, in a number of happenings from, you know, Lamont Young and Cage and Yoko and people like that to, you know, to even doing, uh, you know, one of the first known raves in history, which was the San Francisco Hills, where he would play from sunset to sunrise. So I knew there was that DNA in there and, and I wasn't sure if I could, you know, reactivate him and get him interested in doing something that was very not formal. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of, I kind of like chiseled away slowly and, you know, I told him about this project. I, I mentioned that, you know, we had been filming for uh, two years in the Camargue in the south of France and we wanted to uh, reveal this piece as this very large scale filmic installation inside a, uh, a uh, kind of nearly abandoned uh, train factory. And I wanted this kind of labyrinth that you could walk through and kind of discover these different uh, encounters and different aspects of this piece. It was almost like a moving image earthwork. And I thought that really uh, to premiere this, it would be really interesting to have Terry improvising inside this. And I like this idea that it was improvisational and it wasn't something that was scored. And I like that it, it could potentially be something that could move through the installation instead of being a stage. So initially I mentioned to him, I said, I said, you know, I, I want this to be much more like a happening, much more in, in situ than something where you're on a stage, there's a seated audience. And, you know, I, I knew that, you know, he was just doing those kinds of shows and that's what he'd been doing for the last, you know, decade after decade, you know, and you know, I, I know that, you know, to see him live, it's a very revered experience, but I wanted to challenge him and I wanted him to do something different. So I said, there, there will be no stage. You have to be on the same level as the audience. 
And my, my dream would really be that you're not in one place, but you're in many places. I want you to be nomadic. I want you to roam through the space, through the installation and, you know, and take people with you. So we, we, were, we were talking about this and it just wasn't really happening. And uh, the happening wasn't happening. <laughs> <laughs> One day I, I was working on the sculpture. It was I, it was a hundred degrees out. I had this respirator on. I was sweating inside it, you know, in, in the dirt, making this this artwork. And I, I I feel my phone ring, and I pull it out, and I saw that it was Terry. And this one time, I thought maybe I'll just call him back later. You know, I, I'm 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 so into this. I know he's not going to want to do this. But I took my mask off and I answered. And he said he said, "Hey, I thought about it, and I've got an idea." And do you think, I know this is asking a lot of you, but do you think you could get a donkey for me? And I said, you want a donkey? <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, yeah, I have this idea that you want it to be nomadic and you don't want it on a stage. If you could get a, do- a donkey, I could strap my harmonium to the back of it and I could play while the donkey walks. And maybe you could get oh someone my God. to lead the donkey. So, so this was like the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the the project that's de- amazing. <laughs> so the project kind of developed past the donkey idea, the donkey phase, and eventually it was kind of these four different uh, forms of music that were situated throughout the installation, where he would play for thirty minutes, you know, in, in one suite of projections surrounding him. And, you know, that might be uh, a vocal and piano piece. And then he would just silently get up and walk away. And the audience, the hundreds of people would follow him and he'd go someplace else. There would be a, a quartet and he'd play with the quartet, another 30 minute improvisation, then someplace else with um, electronic uh, sampling like he had done in the 70s. Uh, so it actually just became this kind of, you know, really fresh and unpredictable moment in time. And it was beautiful. And it really kind of also, it, I think it cemented our friendship because he trusted me and we felt a kind of real, uh, almost just like we were from the same family. And, um, and that trust and dialogue kind of just led to other projects and other projects and, um, and, and kind of expanded from there. Yeah, and he he was part of your um, retrospective at MoCA in 2017, right? Where he did, again, improvisations in the Electric Earth kind of installation. And I watched a couple of videos and they are really avant-garde. He uses pins to on a piano to kind of adjust the sound that he gets from the, the strings. You get this really crazy, sharp scratchy noise from it has have you kind of made this effort to to bring artists musicians like terry into the museum setting because that's something that you don't see a lot of i just noticed as well that moma has riley's in c uh composition that kind of landmark 1964 composition where there's a a middle c note just as this incessant kind of background punctuation through the whole 40 minute piece. Um, And they only acquired that in 2013 as part of the Steven Lieber audio collection of albums. It was like 300 album collection. Do you think this is something that's slowly becoming something that museums are bringing into their spaces? I mean, the, the, the the Steven Lieber audio collection is part of the prints and drawings department, which I think is really funny. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess, I guess it all comes full circle because I have a copy of uh, NC from 1964, handwritten from Terry in my bedroom. So Aww. I kind of, kind of wake up around this every day. <laughs> but I think that um, what you're talking about, that idea that, that we could even have a discussion that these things could be siloed and segregated for me is kind of a, it's so inaccurate to the way the mind works, the way creativity functions. You know, I think we live in a world of continuous and radical crossover, and we don't even think about it. You know, the, the, the idea of, I mean, let's talk about the Black Mountain School for a second, where you have, you know, Buckminster Fuller, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, you know, you have all these different people just flowing with ideas, and there's no sense of medium. There's no sense of, you know, you can't do this because you're a musician or you're a visual artist. I, I've never really seen that in my own work. I've always kind of just let the work kind of flow and created uh, collaborations or moments with people of different mediums because it just 
is the way it should be. It's the way it is. And it's interesting how you talk about that idea that this kind of segregation in a way, because I really think that um, the history of arts, the history of culture is so polyphonic and Mm. there's so much to be gleaned from that. Um, You know, you see the collaborations of, you know, the, the theater pieces that Cocteau would direct you know, with the music of someone like Stravinsky. Anyways, I think that that really, you know, one of the things to talk about where we are now, to talk about 2021 and where we move forward from here, you know, I think that we're very, very different society than we were 100 years ago. And we're accustomed to that idea of, of taking fragments of information, of moving rapidly through experience, of kind of harvesting moments that we're attracted to. And this is, this is something that we have never really experienced in human history before, is this idea of the quantity of access that we have, the enormity of, of art and culture and, and landscape and politics that we, we, we're forced to navigate on a daily, yearly basis. And I do think that this will truly influence the art that will come in the future and the art that is probably being made today. I, I know collaboration is a big part of your work and this idea of having access to these different kinds of artists and these different kinds of experiences is really important. But in the last year, you know, we've kind of lost that. And I know you've been working on different kinds of works in the last year because of that, because of those limitations. What, how have you found ways to continue to collaborate and, and find some kind of connection with other kinds of forms of art? No, I think that's a great question. And, uh, In the last 12 months, you know, I think I started by, you know, it was that period that we were all in together where you you don't know if you can go outside. You can't, you know, uh, speak to a human. You're sanitizing a doorknob. (laughs) Um, And and there was that that moment of, of, of serious unrest. And I found myself in that period thinking, you know, how can I create? What can I use? How, how can I kind of make things to make sense and navigate this insane reality that I'm surrounded by? And I found myself actually looking at Art de Povera, and I, I found myself looking at this idea of uh, what's immediately around me and kind of challenging myself by this idea of saying, you know, what's my house? What household goods could I use to create something new that I never had done before? So I I started using fabrics. I started using old clothes initially and kind of uh, cutting them and sewing them into these flags and banners and kind of um, almost like shelter devices. Um, And uh, that kind of grew and it was inspiring and exciting and interesting. And it kind of led me to this place where I had started to make this new body of work. And I thought to myself, this is a very singular thing. It's myself making it, a few friends helping out. But how could I make this a plural experience? How could I share this? So I noticed that I would start to kind of really be attracted to touching these pieces, the, the tactile fabric quality of them. So I, I started thinking, well, what if I had bodies inside these? What if people could wrap themselves inside these artworks? They could roll, they could move, they could flow, they could, their bodies could be in motion. So I reached out to a dance group in Los Angeles. It's, it's also Quarantine, Los Angeles Dance Project. And um, long story short, we started a collaboration and I would uh, go down to... Um, this large empty parking lot in downtown LA. And we would rehearse every day for a few hours for uh, what seemed like weeks. And uh, eventually we created these kind of choreographed patterns, bodies wrapped in these fabric artworks, the bodies moving at times violent and jerky, other times harmonious and flowing. And and then the next step is I thought, I thought okay, now that we're developing this, I don't know where it's going to go, but we should, we should film it. We should make a film out of it because no one can experience this because you know, no one can, is going outside. The city's empty. So we basically created this project that was both performative, that was musical, that was film, that was also textile fabric art and um, kind of made this installation and kind of used our city as this, you know, kind of large blank canvas with no regulation to just go out and make things. How do you think down the line we're going to we're going to see a return for kind of these shared experiences? You know, you did this kind of project a little bit one on one with, you know, a group and you have to be careful that way. But do you think we're going to get back to a point where we have these kinds of big shared experiences, you know, like station to station where you you have big group concerts and and happenings kind of happening? 
Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think we will. That, that's part of our collective psyche is to share, is to kind of have moments where we're together and there's kind of a, a zeitgeist energy. Um, but I think that also perhaps we will uh, return to a reality that's somewhat different than what we had left. And, and for that, I'm very interested in where we're going to go from here. I think this is a, a fascinating and pertinent conversation, you know, because I think that, that we have all been through a kind of passage that we had never experienced before. And what have we learned from this? How have we reflected upon this? And what choices will we make and what will we discard? And, you know, this is going to be a revolutionary moment that we're in now, but also what we do with the experience that we've come through. Well, thank you so much, Doug. This has been really great. Well, the pleasure is mine. It's wonderful sharing with you all. Doug Aitken's exhibition, Flags and Debris, is at Regan Projects in Los Angeles until the 13th of March. And that's it for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page, and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and our other podcast, A Brush With, if you haven't already done so. Please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Town Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Annie, Beeple and Jason, to Helen and Doug, and thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.